Good evening. My name is Alison O'Connor, and I am going to be facilitating uh, this set, this session. I'm delighted to be here. It's a sub. I'm a journalist myself, and it's a subject I'm really interested in, um, particularly after the pandemic. Uh, so the event, public trust in times of crisis. I mean, how appropriate, given as we all know, we're living in a period of perma crisis at the moment, uh, which has a really significant effect on populations and individuals. Um, so we're going to look at all aspects of that, how to build trust, who we trust, why, who we should trust. And here beside me, we have four excellent panelists. And the aim of this evening is we're going to hear, obviously, from our excellent panelists who have some very relevant things to say. But we do also want as much audience participation as possible. So there will be a microphone going around. Uh, so I'm hoping that there will be that there will be really plenty of questions. So I'm just going to introduce our panel and I'm going to start down at the end with Professor Alberto Maloney, who is a member of the group of chief scientific advisors to the European Commission. He's also a professor of Christianity at the University of Medina Reggio Emilia, secretary of the Foundation for Religious Studies and chairholder of the UNESCO Chair on Religious Pluralism and Peace at the University of Bologna. Alberto is founder of the European Academy of Religion and the Lapira Library in Palermo. His publications focus on the history of councils, medieval canon law, and contemporary religious history. He's on the board of several scientific societies and journals and served on three occasions as advisor to the Italian Minister of Education, University, and Research, and he currently advises the Minister of Education. Beside Alberto is Professor Dominica Latuse. This, now I've, I've really <laughs> thought, I've, I've, I've very much fallen down already that I didn't double check this with you. Give me the um, the, a lot of secure track, but we can just go with Latus. Okay. My I, but I, I should have made a more honest effort than that. <laughs> is, is a member of the Sapeo Working Group and is head of the Department of Management of the Center for Trust Research at Kosminski University in Poland. Her work focuses on management practices in interorganizational relations, the theory of social networks, and, <laughs> and trust. She conducts qualitative field research of organizations in Poland, Germany, and Silicon Valley in the US. Dominika was a visiting scholar in the Institute for Research and Social Sciences at Stanford University. She is a member of the Committee on Organizational and Management Sciences of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Then right next to Dominika is uh, Professor Pete Lunn. Uh, Pete is a voice that we would have become very used to hearing in this country during, uh, during the pandemic, uh, both on radio and television, and uh, one that always made really good sense. To me, at any rate, uh, Pete is the founder and head of the Behavioural Research Unit at the ESRI. The unit has pioneered the use of experimental methods for addressing policy problems in Ireland. His primary area of study is how people make decisions that affect their financial, environmental and health outcomes. Pete and his team have undertaken behavioural research for more than a dozen state agencies and six government departments in Ireland, as well as internationally for the European Commission and the OECD. Much of this work involves experimental tests of how people interact with government policies and administrative systems. And last, but by no means least, right beside me here is Deputy Dennis Nocton. Dennis is a TD for the Roscommon Galway constituency. He's been a deputy for 26 years and served as Minister for Communications, Climate Action and Environment from 2016 to 18. He's a scientist by prof profession and is the chairperson of the Interparliamentary Union Working Group on Science and Technology and convener of the Oireachtas Friends of Science and Technology, a parliamentary forum to facilitate direct engagement between TD senators and the scientific community. And he's presently Cahirlik, which is the chair of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Social Protection, Community, Rural Development and the Islands. And he's passionate in his belief that stronger structures and relationship, relationships need to be developed between the scientific community and TDs. So that's our panel, and we're going to begin. I'm going to begin with a um, a question to Alberto. Alberto, given your your position and your experience, can you talk to us a bit generally about the EU scientific advice mechanism and the challenges of giving scientific advice at that multinational level in the EU? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you, the uh, the university, for this event. Uh, I was going around this morning and this afternoon. It's uh, very stimulating and uh, excellent uh, 
uh, set of ideas that are coming uh, on. What I will say are not the opinion of the group of statistical archives, and it's my own opinion and my experience, of course, and this is pretty coming from uh, this uh, scientific advice mechanism, the, the, the SUM, as it is called, established by Commissioner Moe Dash uh, some eight years ago. And uh, it is a part of a series of uh, bodies at the European uh, level, trying to match the two sides of the quest of the, of the problem on one side, uh, science for policy, and on the other, policy for uh, science. As it was told a few moments ago in this uh, room, uh, the two things are not so separate as one may expect. And uh, the, the connection is very simple and very known, is money. Uh, uh, if you have more policy for science means, means money, and science for policy means a way to in, invest, and use, and avoid dispersion of that uh, money. At the European level, uh, the group of the Chief Scientific Advisor works uh, through SAPEA, that is uh, the organization of the academies, as all you know, uh, that has a contract with the Commission for offering to the group and to the Commission uh, evidence review reports and documents uh, trying to inspire and decide on a different decision. Uh, there, there are the, uh, just a part of the, of the mechanism because there are other bodies. There is a body of the advisor of the member states. Uh, and there is a, a body concerning ethics aspects. And so the epistemic foundation of all the system is very complicated, and this is a matter of trust. Uh, to be transparent, it means not only to be uh, immune for conflict of interest and the request of a big uh, interest coming into science, but also to be transparent to the fact that, that science can be reliable for the people uh, looking at uh, it. In this sense, there are some points that I'd like to uh, underline. We uh, have a, a couple of naive attitude to avoid. A naive attitude is that we do represent, I'm a church historian, so you will forgive me if I speak my own language, uh, that we are the people expressing an orthodoxy. Uh, we define the orthodoxy of the relation between science and politics, between science and society. Orthodoxy is dominated by hard science, that are the bishops, and there are minor clerics, that are the humanities. Uh, both do belong to the orthodox system, and out there, there are uh, rude pagans, who does not understand what we the Orthodox explain. So this is a very dangerous, naive attitude because it put into discussion one point that will come in a few moments. The, the second point that comes from this naive attitude is that we science do belong to eternity. Uh, we, have, uh, we, be, we belong to an eternal truth. Unfortunately, out there, the pagans are ruled by democratic systems, and they have to uh, afford a certain compliance to consensus, or even to democratic election. That are very dangerous things because they prevent us from the long-term decision that we are implementing. So, to come out from this uh, naive attitude is a very essential point for all the different level and system involved in uh, science for policy and policy for science, because it does include the fact that, that we have to talk not about values, but about virtues. Values in uh, Latin means the price of something that you can buy and sell. And so values are very dangerous uh, mm, companions. And because, of course, uh, people are at least to have some values, but the conflict of values has no particular solution. Uh, you can irritate and produce uh, rebound effects if you challenge them too strongly, or they can uh, produce effects that are not uh, so desirable. The problem is to uh, give the right space to some virtues that are, in my view, essential 
for this mechanism of science uh, for policy and also for policy for science. Namely, to leave room to uh, the, the doubt, doubt even about science advice. Uh, there is a sample that I'm always hesitant uh, to do, but probably in uh, the middle of the 30s, 30s, uh, racist scientists were very keen to offer science for policy to racist policies. And uh, they were not at all immune for uh, this. And th th thanks God, uh, we, we are not in the same position. We're not in the same uh, uh, mood. But this, we, we must leave room to doubt, to mistrust. We must trust the mistrust. We must learn from uh, the suspicion. And we must uh, learn from the fact that, that uh, people is not so keen to accept whatever is uh, said by uh, usually a white male speaking in the name of science as it, uh, it's supposed to be a, a woman. The second point is uh, we have to uh, adopt some principles in, uh, in this attitude. And uh, one of the things that is important from our point of view, from my experience in the group of the chief ethical advisors, is the fact that we, we, we cannot put into discussion democracy. If somebody do consider that uh, Xi Jinping deliver much quickly that Ursula von der Leyen, well, they can take a flight to, to Beijing. Uh, I prefer a slow, fallible mechanism instead of an authoritarian mechanism. And the, the risk that science of policy become part of a, um, a um, somebody who was speaking this morning of technopopulism, can be part of technopopulism, is a real risk. Another virtue that we have to adopt is the fact that we have to refine our language. Uh, I learned and remember when uh, this other definition of Carlos Moedas research is uh, money producing knowledge, innovation is uh, uh, knowledge producing, producing uh, money. But we have another point, another um, uh, diptych to define that is the diptych including scientists and scholars. During the pandemic, during the crisis, we have seen that probably the people that we needed more are constitutional lawyers, people speaking about rights, explaining that uh, uh, rights are not a matter of numerable uh, aspect, but are part of a science that is a non-numerable science coming from this. In this uh, sense, the experience of the research that I've uh, listened to in, uh, in this day are very interesting because not by chance they come from university. Uh, as you remember, when it was uh, created in, uh, in Bologna, the, the name of uh, university was uh, uh, Universitas Scienziarum, University of Sciences, the, the unity of the different sciences. And so to live in the advice room to different expertise is also the reason because the church historian is a part of the group of seven, uh, chief scientific advisors of the commission. And I do hope that in this sense, uh, many different disciplines may be involved because as we have seen uh, from psychology to technology, uh, there is room for a more complex uh, picture of reality. Thank you. Okay, Alberto, thank you very much. Um, Dominique, I'm going to ask you now for, for your view on why, why trust is important, why we need trust, why we need trust in institutions. Um, thank you for that question. And let me first thank the Parisian group and the university for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm really honored and glad to be able to uh, speak tonight. Um, why trust is important? I mean, this is... I think this is a question that everyone here can, uh, can uh, answer in a different way. So, you know, trust is important in our private lives. This is, a, this is the essence of our relationships. Um, relations between people are built on trust. Otherwise, they are meaningless. But why do we need trust in uh, institutions? And here, um, the, the answer should be and can be more pragmatic. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we need trust in uh, institutions because of trust functionalities. Trust um, makes our collective life easier, better, makes the decision making uh, quicker and enables us to accept risk, which otherwise uh, wouldn't be possible. We just, thanks to, thanks to trust, we are able to take a leap of faith over uncertainties of, of everyday life. However, this trust between people, between me and you, and this trust between people and institutions is different. And I think we all feel that, that you know, we label this as trust. The label, the, 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 um, the word is the same, but the essence and the meaning of that uh, trust is different. Um, and um, the link between trust and institutions has, um, I think, has a very interesting double nature, which we should consider. So for institutions to be able to produce trust between people, between strangers, between people who need to some some who sometimes need to interact with abstract targets, institutions to produce that trust to be practical to be functional they need to be trusted themselves first right so in order for institutions to produce trust we first need to trust them so that's why we need trust uh, we need that trust um, uh, so much and now how to build it again. This is different than between people. And I think it's crucial to consider these two differences. So first, uh, with institutions and especially with public institutions, you know, quite often we don't have direct interactions, right? So we, we are not able to build that trust on experience as with our colleagues, partners, mm. uh, um, um, uh, co-workers. Uh, we, we rarely have uh, opportunities for direct interaction. And here comes the crucial uh, role of media, mm -hmm. because this is how we get information about the institutions. Uh, and the second crucial difference that I think is very important to reflect um, on is that in relations between citizens and institutions, you know, Quite often we don't have a choice. So, you know, we cannot, I mean, if, even if we say that we do not trust them, we still are with them, we have to rely on them and we cannot walk away from them. So th there, is, th there is no, in, in some cases, maybe there is some choice, but it's very limited. And then that leads me to a conclusion whether we should talk about trust at all in a relationship between citizens and institutions. Uh, if citizens have no choice, uh, then this is a different type of trust, maybe closer to, to confidence, uh, to risk-free environment, uh, rather than trust, which is inherently risky. If we are trusting, we take the risk, and we always leave the room for failure. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dominika. That was really interesting. So, Pete, in your opinion, where lies trust? Dominika talks there about the trust in institutions. A lot of them are currently struggling uh, post-COVID. Um, where, where do you think it's at? Wow, what a question. So, <laughs> <laughs> my reading, in all honesty, and I, I'm not an expert in the political science of trust, mm. but I do read some of the political science of trust, and my reading of it is that the commonly argued position that trust in public institutions has declined in recent decades hold. I, mm. I think there is I think there is truth in that. Now there are some people who still dispute that and there are measurement issues. My experience is that it holds. Mm. Um, and I think that's right. And then you might say, well, okay, does it matter? Uh, yes, it does. Um, and one of the ways I think you can I, I just want to put a framework on a crisis, if I can, which sounds like a very big task, but actually Quite a simple thing to do. Anyway. I know you were up to the job. Um, That's why the question was as big as was. What we really mean by a crisis? What we really mean by a crisis is that the everyday systems that we have built and that have evolved, and the expertises that we have to deal with the day to day, are suddenly faced with something that is too big and too difficult for them. Mm. 
So we start to lose our faith in the systems that we have built. That's what a crisis is. That's why we perceive it and we say, this isn't just a policy problem. Oh no, it's a crisis because we can see that the systems that we have, the everyday systems, the everyday expertise are not designed for this eventuality. And when you face a crisis, things have to happen if you're going to cope with it successfully. Now, one of the great things is that behavioral science will tell you that the idea that when a crisis happens, everyone starts to behave selfishly and you get societal breakdown is precisely incorrect. Mm. So actually, all of the evidence suggests that what typically happens is the large majority of people pull together and you know, behave collectively very well for each other and you will, will make sacrifices for the public good. So that's the good news. The less good news is that that's hard to do. It varies quite a lot depending on circumstances. And sometimes it doesn't work. And if you want to get through a crisis, it's really helpful to understand why and when people will make sacrifices for the common good. And we all have to do that during COVID as individual citizens. But you're also asking people within institutions and your scientific, scientific experts to do exactly the same thing in a crisis. They're being asked to work outside of their normal systems, to work different hours, to think in different in different ways to apply their expertise to things that might go against their everyday and normal incentives and so on. In a crisis, trust becomes paramount because what it is is it's the basis under which people will behave collectively and will make these sacrifices for the public good that we need in order to try to address a crisis. Now, I'm coming to a point here, which kind of goes as follows, right? We actually know quite a lot about what drives people's behavior in those circumstances. And we've known it for about 30, 40 years. Right? The things that really matter are that people have to be able to see how, if they do make those sacrifices, the beneficial outcome will, will occur. So they have to have a clear perspective on if we all do this and if I do this, it leads towards the collective outcome that deals with this crisis that we want. Right? That has to happen. They also have to believe that other people are going to see that and do that too. OK, mm -hmm. and then they have to feel a sense of common identity with the people who are involved in the crisis. Right now, the thing about that is all three of those things depend absolutely crucially on the communication that you get from the politicians from the scientists from the experts within your community and how that lands with the public and with other members of that of that community. Um, but you do know that's what you have to do. And if you want to have that trust that drives people's behavior, so that they will behave for the collective good, so they will go those extra miles to deal with crises and that crises don't affect us as badly as they might, that communication, getting that sense of collective identity is absolutely vital. I wish, and I'm just going to finish with this, I wish I had actually written somewhere at the start of the COVID pandemic the prediction that small, coherent countries would, that are more cohesive would do better in the face of the pandemic than larger, more polarized ones. You're saying that's right. that would have been your prediction? It was, but I only said it in the kitchen and I didn't write it down. <laughs> which was obviously a huge error of judgment. We, are, we believe you. Um, but saying, saying it's only in the kitchen and just saying, you know, that, that is what I think will happen. I think Ireland will actually do much better than Britain. And actually, when you look at it all, you know, Denmark did better than Sweden and Germany, Ireland did better than Britain, Canada did better than the US, New Zealand, did better than Australia. Any way you look, the smaller, I, more cohesive place. Come on to Dennis. Can I ask you then just to go back, though, to that's, that was all during the crisis. And what about now and this notion of institutions being under pressure? And also, you, you marry with that, where we think at the end of COVID, but as I mentioned earlier, this perma-crisis idea of, you, you know, particularly we'll say with the war in Ukraine. Yeah, good. So that's where you end up, of course. So if you're saying, well, look, the, the trust in the institutions really matters because it helps you to deal with the crisis. I mean, you have to have that level of trust in order to be able to deal with the, the challenges that are thrown at you. Yes, it matters on an everyday basis, but when does it really matter? It really matters when society has a crisis. So yes, if there's a general decline in trust, it reduces our ability to deal with those crises. And if there's a general decline in trust in science, it reduces our ability organize and harness expertise to deal with crises. So on an everyday basis, increasing that trust really matters too. Now that's partly a different kind of conversation yeah. about, because you're not trying to generate trust very quickly to deal with a crisis. It's about how we deal with it over years. And I think one of the points that Alberto made was absolutely crucial in all of this actually, that the biggest lesson I learned to someone who provides science for policy 
when I first started doing it is I went into doing it thinking that my job would be to spread knowledge. And I learned pretty quickly that was wrong. My job was to spread doubt. And one of the things that's really, really difficult about building trust in institutions is that quite often people want strong leaders. They quite often want certainty. Mm -hmm. But real expertise doesn't come with strong leadership and certainty of that sort. Real strong leadership and expertise comes with knowing what you know, what you don't know, being willing to communicate doubt, and managing nevertheless to make people feel confident that you're doing the right thing in the face of that doubt. And I think yeah. one of the things that we have to learn with our institutions, and one of the things I, I wish we could get into our politics, is that changing your mind is not a bad thing. <laughs> and I'm sure this is a good time to talk to Dennis. The, uh, before Dennis starts, I will say, to be fair, given the times we live in and the, the social media age and everything, it isn't easy no. to, you know, to, to, for what... For, the, for what you face afterwards. So Dennis, you have the unique, I suppose, perspective of political and scientific, given, given your background. So maybe you can give us your perspective on you know, where, you, where you felt the two married or didn't. Uh, and even, I suppose, Pete's prediction there that as a smaller society, you know, we were going to do, do well and we did. But when I was coming in here, here this evening, Alison said she's not going to let us have, have a speech and she's going to pull me up after 10 minutes uh, of speaking. Hi. But um, I jotted down a couple of notes coming in here and at the very top of my notes I've said politicians are afraid to say that they got things wrong. Mm. So it's building on what Pete has spoken about. And the one thing, I like, I have been in every side of Parliament, I've been a minister, I've been on the opposition benches, I've been supporting governments, I've been opposing governments uh, down through the years. Uh, and the one thing that politicians are afraid to do is to say, look, we're not 100% certain in relation to it. We know A, B and C, but there's a risk in relation to, to D and E. Uh, and based on the evidence that we have now, this is the decision we're going to make. Uh, and it is a judgment call uh, in relation to that. And in science, the one thing you do and, you know, you theorize, uh, you then uh, have experimental evidence to back that up. Uh, and then you find that your uh, theory doesn't hold up to the experimental evidence. You alter that, that uh, and base it on the new research and evidence that you have and go back and say, look, we got it wrong. Actually, it is now something else because we've done uh, the experiments and we've shown the reality is, is very different. But in politics, you will never have a minister coming in and saying, look, what I told you six months ago was wrong. Uh, the circumstances have now changed. This is the approach that we need to take based on the evidence uh, that we have now. And this is not just the ministers, it's the uh, the whole culture within uh, government departments. I remember uh, when I went into the Department of Energy and there was a real policy to push um, uh, wind turbines around the country. And everything was 100% renewable energy was focused on, on wind energy generation from land-based wind turbines. And I remember saying to the officials, I said, why are you focused just on wind turbines? What about solar? What about offshore? What about biomass? Well, Minister, uh, renewable energy is based on wind turbines and only wind turbines. I said, why? He said, that's the policy. I said, when was that policy developed? Oh, Eamon Ryan did it about 10 years ago. And because it hadn't been reviewed and updated since then, the application was still the same. So everything was determined based on the evidence that was available when Eamon Ryan was minister, because the policy hadn't been revised and updated since then, because technology had come on and come on dramatically in terms of the opportunities that were there in relation to renewable energy uh, at the time. And because that didn't change, then the policy didn't change the approach and the advice to the minister didn't change, the legislative approach didn't change. And that's why science and that relationship between science and policymakers, not just, and I've spoken to, to Philip Nolan here earlier on, 
not just an advice to government departments and ministers, but also to parliament. We need that relationship that we can say, actually, the evidence is changing here. You need to review the approach uh, that you're taking in terms of renewable energy because microgeneration now has provides huge opportunities. And I think I also made the point here earlier on, we must leave room uh, for doubt. And that's the one thing that we didn't do during COVID. Everything was seen as black and white. Follow the science. The science was perceived from the way the politicians articulated that to be black and white. Science is never black and white as we know. And during COVID, we were basing things on our best estimate based on the evidence we had at that particular point in time. That was a dynamic situation that was always going to change. But yes, once the politicians took a particular position, they couldn't draw back from it. And I think one of the brave decisions that we're taking in this country is we have now decided that we're actually going to review uh, what we did during COVID. And I'm determined to make sure that this is not about blaming people for the decisions that they made. You know, whether they were the right decisions or wrong decisions at this stage really doesn't matter because people did it with the best intention based on the advice that they had at that stage. But if we find out what was right and wrong, we can learn from that. We can say, well, why did we make that particular decision that was wrong? Why did we make that particular decision that was right? What was the information that we had? What was the approach uh, in relation to that? How can we strengthen uh, that again if we're in that situation? And I was in, um, I was in Bahrain last week. Uh, I'm a member of a working group of 21 parliamentarians from across the globe and we had a, a meeting last week and I was talking to my German colleagues and I was telling them that we were doing this review in Ireland looking at COVID what we did right and what we did wrong we said we'd never do that in Germany <laughs> and I said why not because the opposition had used it as a stick against us they'd be calling for the resignation uh, of the the minister whoever the minister was and I think that's what we need to get away from you know for a minister to come in and put up his or her hands and say, look, we got this wrong, the evidence has changed. It shouldn't automatically mean that that minister should resign. And I think if we can change that culture, and I think a review of COVID is maybe the big opportunity we have in this country to change that culture of blame, to actually use it as a learning process. And I think it will make our political system far more responsive to issues, uh, far more trustworthy, and I know that you know, on a barometer it's at, at the lowest ebb uh, in relation to that. But it's not just politics, the political establishment, the policymakers, it's the institutions as well. And as Pete said, it's about building, you know, that point that of spreading doubt, of, you know, making the point we are making decisions based on the evidence uh, that we have, and we may have to review and change that in the future. Thank you very much, Dennis. I think that was a really good, a very broad um, uh, spectrum of um, of thoughts. Um, so an, an awful lot to go on. But as I said earlier, we're really keen to have involvement of, of everyone here. So I'm going to, there's, uh, there is a microphone. So if you'd like to ask a question, please put up your hand. And if you maybe tell us who you are or where you're from. Now, I'm very keen to get questions rather than at this point, rather than contributions. Uh, and if you want to, if you want to generally, or you can specify that you want to uh, ask a question of a, yep, let's see first gentleman over there with a the hat. Thank you. Uh, Kian, uh, Kian Minswu, uh, University College Cork. So this is a question for Pete Lunn. I, I was really intrigued by your suggestion that um, some, some societies do better than others uh, due to trust uh, small country size and so forth. Um, so what do you think are the factors that would lead us to continue to grow that trust? I think that that is a really important part of the society, uh, but what do you think is needed to sustain that? Um, and what do you think contributed to us having that? Thanks. But Pete, I'm getting all the small questions. <laughs> That's a cracking question. And to be honest, if I actually had a decent answer to it, I'd win a Nobel Prize. Um, I can take a stab at an answer to it. Interestingly, 
at the current time, my answer is actually quite defensive. Um, I, there will be political scientists in the room who might wish to dispute this, but as things stand, I don't think we have a really good grip on what has driven the political polarization that we have seen in recent times. Although I say recent times, actually there's some good academic evidence that it's starting growing in the United States as far back as the early 1970s. Nevertheless, I don't think we have a good handle on it. And I think it's a threat to that cohesion. Um, so go back to what I said about solving collective action problems and how you deal with crises and how important it is that people are willing to make sacrifices for the public good, be that experts, be that politicians, be that ordinary people on the street. You are much more likely to do that if you have a common group identity with the people you are trying to do it with. And polarization is a threat to that ability to solve collective action problems because it makes you feel like there are others within your society who are not in the same group as you and are somehow an out group or are somehow an enemy. Now, of course, you know, in, in a democratic political system, you know, debate from different parties, that's all part of a democratic political system, but that has to take place in an atmosphere of civility, in an atmosphere of where open debate and disagreement is something that's actually lauded and understood rather than something that engenders hostility, anger, and intolerance, which is what we increasingly appear to be perceiving. So my answer to your question is actually quite defensive, which is we do everything we can to avoid that polarization in places like Ireland. And I have to say at the moment, there's some symptoms arising suggesting we are getting more polarization than even maybe we had two or three years ago, if you look for those symptoms. So the apologies for the answer is defensive. What do you do about it? I think you have to really stick up for those common values. I think it's absolutely vital that you don't descend into kind of those kind of inter sign political wars and that you stick up for the things that you agree about as a democratic society and that you're really successful in doing it. And where polarization has taken hold, I think it's because there hasn't been enough of that. And if you're too late getting to it, you've got a problem. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Now, next question. My goodness, I thought, I thought with this audience we'd have um, a bit of competing. Uh, great. Pat Geyer, University College Dublin, the Royal Irish Academy. Very nice presentation. Thanks very much. Trust has a lot to do with communication. So communication, mm -hmm. you know, who, who's giving the message? So how important is the media in terms of trust? Yeah. Dominique, would you, I mean, I know you're giving, you, I'm curious even to broaden it out just from the Irish perspective. I know that's a question that Peter Dennis would be well, but even in Poland where you're from, or your your Sapea experience in terms of of trust, um, and and sorry, in terms of the media being able to help engender trust. Um, thank you for that question. I mean, I'm not a communication scholar, yeah. but a media scholar, so um, uh, perhaps we have more experts in the in the audience who can uh, competently address that. But I think uh, in building trust in institutions, media is absolutely crucial because so, this is the only source mm. of information about the potential trustworthiness of an institution, yeah. right? And uh, what that trustworthiness um, consists of? It consists of judgments of competence, whether the institution is competent, judgments of benevolence, mm. so whether that institution has my interest in heart in its decision, and then uh, judgments of integrity. So do we have common um, virtues or values? Yeah. Uh, do we agree uh, on values? And I, I'm afraid, but this is again a layman judgment, mm. that much of that communication is increasingly focused focusing on the integrity dimension, um, highlighting the differences in values. And here comes the conclusion. If we look at what drives trust and what drives distrust, the difference in values drives distrust. So I would never distrust the institution if it's incompetent. Then it's, it's just incompetent, right? right? But if, I um, consider that institution unethical if we don't agree on basic values mm. that triggers not um, the, a decline in trust, but that triggers distrust. And um, here a vicious cycle um, uh, can begin. Um, 
So yeah, that would be okay. Because I know it's something in the in the report, the strategic crisis management in the in the European Union that, that talked about the importance of our, of even having a across the EU um, communication committee and even addressing the whole issue of of social media, which is I think a whole other evening's uh, work. Yeah. There's a there's a general discussion, and I think this is something for us to discuss and to reflect upon. The, the 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 relationship between misinformation mm -hmm. and distrust. So does misinformation drive distrust, mm -hmm. or does distrust drive yes. misinformation? It can be a vicious cycle. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> but just on that, and one of the things I, I was doing some some work looking at um, the HSE and it's community. Which is our, sorry, Dennis, which yeah. is for, for those of you that's sorry. our health, health service executive that run, runs our health service. Our health service executive here, looking at its campaign in terms of the uptake of vaccinations. Uh, and one of the things that the health service executive here did during the whole vaccination program was that it used its social media accounts, particularly Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, as a mechanism to respond to questions. So you had the public who had questions regarding issues and risks with particular vaccines or who should have it and who shouldn't have it. And they were providing factual evidence and responses back to them. And the evidence shows because the HSE had built up a relationship through its social media platforms in advance uh, of, of the, the pandemic, there was a relationship and trust there already. Uh, and it allowed them to use that platform as a mechanism to get factual information out there, to deal with the, the disinformation, to give people a reliable uh, form of, of, of factual information that they could use. And it just coming back to, to, to peace in terms of the issue of polarization, I agree with you. Uh, and I think it is a real, real risk uh, where you don't have a tolerance in, in parliament or in, in debate uh, for alternative perspectives and alternative views, that everything is black and white. It's all about the soundbite. And it comes back to the question uh, on media. And this is something that I tried to grapple with as, as Minister for Communications uh, during my time, because the difficulty is that the actual financial resources available for journalism today have been pared back and pared back. Uh, a lot of journalists today are not journalists. They're opinion writers uh, rather than journalists reporting uh, factual information and letting people uh, make up their own minds. And this is partly the whole social media culture, but also I honestly believe it's because a lot of journalists today are pressurized with timelines, whether it is to, to post it online, to post their blog, to do their uh, podcast, to produce the print content for the paper uh, the next day. They don't have actually time to analyze what government is saying. They don't have time to investigate that and to provide the alternative credible options in relation to it. And it was very interesting. It's probably one of the most significant reports that I've seen during my time in politics and it was a report that was produced by Martin Fraser uh, in relation to an investigation. Martin Fraser was the chief uh, civil servant here in Ireland at the time. And he produced a report on a strategic communications unit within government. And he said in it that, you know, media pluralism and having a properly resourced media uh, in Ireland or any other country was a vital part of democracy. And that we as a state needed to look at innovative ways uh, to actually fund that. And that's true today. And I think mm -hmm. any democracy now needs to look at how can they provide communication through a media, a broad media platform that gives factual information. And we're very lucky here compared to the polarization that we've seen in media in many other parts of Europe and many other parts of the world. But it's interesting. You know, the polarization we see uh, across the water in the UK or across the water in the United States uh, happens in tandem with a lot of polarization that we've seen in the media. So I think both run uh, hand in hand, and it is part of a broader debate, I think, that we do need to have.
Thank you, Janice. Uh, yep, gentleman just here in the second, the second row. Yep, yep. Oh, one second. Just there. Uh, my name is Luke Drury, I'm Vice President of Alia. Uh, just following up on Pete's point, which I think is very valid, that uh, an important dimension of trust is social cohesion and belonging to the in-group and not an out-group. If I look at this from the perspective of a scientist, how do we ensure that scientists as individuals are seen as members of the ordinary society and not an elite ivory tower separate group? And what are the implications of that for trust in science, which is what we're talking about? Alberto, would you like to, uh, to take that question? Yeah. Uh, well, for, for me, the, the point is uh, um, th that uh, communication has a double side. Uh, there is a communication in which the content is uh, what is communicated, and there is communication in which the content is who is communicating. Mm. And uh, so in, in, in the peculiar situation that we have uh, uh, seen during the, the COVID, uh, the, the sense was that uh, not nor the politician, nor scholars, nor scientists, nor the media were prepared to face uh, incompatible opinions in conflict. And uh, so the, the idea was that uh, there was not the simple mechanism of democracy that was capable to make a choice, but there was something that we do not know where it is, and we were looking for this uh, second uh, uh, level of, uh, of decision. And so for, for scholars and for scholarship, the problem is uh, the educational chain, if I can call it in that uh, way, that goes from early childhood to uh, the adult uh, time. If uh, the majority of the population is oriented to a type of culture and a type of education that is oriented to produce good workers for the system, this could work for a certain time, but in, in a due moment, the price will be paid. And so people incapable to have critical opinion, to discern in social media and so on, uh, will, uh, will pay the price and you will uh, have the sense what happened during the vaccination campaign, mm -hmm. in which the more the people were uh, deprived of instrument of understanding, the more were doubtful and scared by what was going on. And so the, the problem of offering a good level of uh, education concerning uh, all sciences uh, is part of the complex society. This will come also in the moment in which we will uh, go from the idea of communication as a neutral aspect mm. to the social media algorithmic predictive uh, communication in which uh, my polarized opinion, the, the, the potential polarization inside me is feeded by an algorithm. And so I'm pushed more and more in my corner so to become a very visible and easy client mm -hmm. for uh, the system. Alberto, and, may, may I ask you, sorry to interrupt you, there were periods during COVID though, when all people wanted from experts was their expertise and they that they wished for a degree of certainty rather than doubt would you agree uh, well um, scared people can desire horrible things mm. and uh, so this was uh, covid was uh, uh, the, the greatest uh, disaster in uh, the west caused no but not by a war but by uh, other reasons. So it's the first time since the 17th century that we had to face something like uh, this. Uh, so to say, unfortunately, we were not provided of other instrument except an, an argument of trust and mm. faith mm. in uh, the idea yeah. that the experts are doing much better than the politician. This was one of the most dangerous uh, things. And what we did not consider, uh, that there is plenty of literature explaining uh, this, uh, from uh, the book of the Leviticus uh, to Dostoevsky, uh, 
that uh, in, uh, in time of pestilence and danger, all the type of relations are uh, weakened. And so the type of cohesion uh, that uh, you were describing is weakened in the most nuclear sense, mm -hmm. in the most nuclear uh, level. So what we can learn from the COVID crisis is that uh, some stupid things, uh, crisis will happen. When, when I listen to permanent uh, karma crisis, uh, I always remember Bill Clinton explaining to his competitor, it's economy stupid. Maybe you remember this moment of the debate. And so the perma crisis uh, is human human existence stupid. Uh, we live in perma crisis. Uh, I have a couple of big crises uh, per week, one way or another. And uh, I'm as a human being, I'm designed by uh, a certain number of uh, issues to face crisis. And in crisis, the problem is how do you put uh, your uh, mm, sense of being a part of a community yeah. uh, in front of things that seems to be your personal interest in the short term? Yes. Yeah. Brief, briefly, Pete, just yeah, I, I want to go back to that. Really brief, just sure. it's a great question. I desperately want to come yeah. in on that, if that's okay. I, I genuinely think that the answer to your question lies within the science community itself and not outside. Yeah. The reason I work for the SRI and not in the university is precisely the concern that you've just articulated. The scientific community cannot cut itself off. Right. Good communication has to be part of all scientific research, all scientific research grants, and the way that it interacts with the rest of society is vital. We will always know brilliant scientists who are useless communicators and are not good uh, communicating the science, that's fine. But the community as a whole has to place greater priority on it because the risk is we become perceived as an elite. And when that elite fails, as inevitably sometimes it will, right, we then suffer the consequences. So that, that greater humility, that greater openness and that willingness to in, be involved in an inclusive open science that brings the community in, I think is yeah. vital. <laughs> and what I'd like to say to Alberto is I completely agree, but I also would like to live in less interesting times. <laughs> Six months. No, um, that lady there. In a fairly Trinity College Dublin <laughs> uh, scientist. <laughs> um, but my question is um, about uh, what the panel thinks about involving children and school teachers in building trust in society. Okay. Who'd like to take that first? Uh, well, uh, usually, uh, um, this is a self-critique. Self usually when somebody says that we have to start from the school, uh, I turn off uh, the, the, the the audio. Uh, it's to, to, to come on to banal, to stupid, to be, to be said. But we have a big problem. Uh, we live in a, in a situation in which we have not only the environmental climate change, we have many climate changes that are affecting our society. All well, this is not at all uh, unique uh, in, uh, in history, but it is our task. So in the climate change, we have a climate change concerning the production of knowledge and the use of knowledge. Knowledge for the few was very well designed to build up the leading classes that are by nature, by family, by the closeness of the society designed to rule. The open society is producing much more people that are not unable to the same type of role, but the problem is what and can be taught there. And in my view, the problem of uh, the complexity of sciences is one of the, of the point. We have uh, this pendular movement saying, uh, you know, people in uh, the city, in Wall Street, uh, he is hiring philosopher much more than economists because they are more prepared to different things. And on the other side, you have the idea, uh, we have to add mathematics uh, uh, to the curricula uh, because they don't uh, understand uh, nothing. The problem of having a complexity of the human dignity of the human being as the target of the building of our society, this is one of the points that I think. And the role of scientists, scholars, uh, in this type of beasts in uh, society is to be more available to do what they are supposed to do. The, the education of the teachers, for me, is one of the most important aspects mm -hmm. for the future of Europe. Mm 
Now, I don't know if anybody else wants to, we're, we're coming close to the closing time and I do want to get one more question in before that. And you had your hand up, so that'll be you there that we're in the front. But before, does anybody want to briefly add to that or will we go to the... Very, very quickly. Sure. sure. Um, go I'm going to declare an interest here as a former chairperson in Educate Together School. Um, and for those of you who are not Irish, Educate Together schools are schools in Ireland that celebrate diversity and difference. Um, my kids are at one of those schools. I think what that does to their relationship with adult society um, and their willingness to trust and engage with it is massively positive. And I think an education system that celebrates that diversity, uh, respects it, and understands difference is vital. Thank you, Peter. Dominique, did you want to? Or no. no have a question. Sure. Yeah, Brad Norton, Royal Irish Academy. Um, first of all, agree with Pete's last point, but then just going back to your earlier point around smaller countries doing better, and I know you meant that in particular context of the pandemic. If you look at corruption seas, there are many, many small countries which are hopelessly corrupt. And that's due to disparities in wealth, disparities in information flows, disparities in education. And we see those growing in countries that previously did not have those. So there are other underlying challenges to the maintenance of trust. Go ahead. Look, that's a great question. And the flip side of the common group identity that I'm talking about is helping you to solve those coordination problems that a small country benefits from is that small country can become too insular and discriminatory. I mean, I was one of the first people who ran one of the experiments showing at the SRI, we ran an experiment showing the extent of discrimination in the Irish labour market by sending matched CVs that had foreign names and Irish names to companies. You were twice as likely to get a callback if you had an Irish surname than if you had a foreign surname in our experiment. So that very cohesiveness, which is high by international standards, if you measure this internationally, that's high. And we don't, in Ireland, we don't think of ourselves as a discriminatory society, and yet we have that very high level. But the primary reason was actually in-group favoritism. It's the very cohesion. It wasn't hostility to others. It was the very cohesion and the in-group favoritism that was driving the result we found in that particular society. And it is a real problem, right? And the, the solution to it is not obvious, but what it actually has to be is that you, your group identity has within it a real concept of diversity, you know, that it, it isn't based on criteria that are exclusionary, you know, or that are based on factors that we think of as discriminatory, right? That the common values, the common things that you're pulling into that, that identity are things that can embrace diversity and different opinions and so on, but it's not a simple problem. It's really hard. <laughs> Just to follow on, on from that uh, and listen to the debate this evening, and like in Ireland, we would pride ourselves in having a small open economy. Uh, and I think it, it's also about having, as a small country, an open attitude to different ideas and different approaches and different solutions. Um, and I suppose, you know, we have, because of the political structure that we have uh, in Ireland, where we have a plethora of parties, you know, it will be a coalition that will be formed, after, likely to be formed after the next election and probably for the foreseeable uh, future. And it's much harder to have a polarised situation in countries where you have a fragmented political system because you need to compromise to, to form uh, a government. And it would be interesting, Pete, to see the comparison between, you know, uh, maybe the uh, large uh, single party governments in different countries compared to coalition governments and how they looked uh, at, at the impact in relation to COVID. But it comes back to the, the question that, that Luke had raised earlier in relation to scientists. And look, the primary responsibility of a scientist is to communicate their results. And every scientist sees that as publication, peer review, uh, which gives you your status within uh, your own uh, particular field. But as you know, even from a scientific perspective, where science is going to grow and develop is the intermingling of different skills and different skill sets, chemistry and physics, uh, biology and chemistry and physics and so forth. At those inter, uh, interactions between those particular professions and particular specialities that can't happen at a peer-reviewed level because you know the physicists are not reading the chemical journals or the biological journals so one way to get your message across is in the more mainstream media 
but it's also a way of getting out of that ivory tower, getting out of that elitist approach in actually communicating with decision makers, policy makers, and the citizens in terms of new innovative ideas, new research that's being out there. And that has to be embedded as a culture in every single scientist that is coming through our education system today. Any scientist that is getting public funding has to have a responsibility to communicate to the widest spectrum of, as possible. I think if we can instill that and from a policy perspective in a small open economy, have an open approach to ideas, we can capitalize on some of those innovative ideas as well. So I think that's a great battle cry uh, on which we will conclude. And it seems to have gone by really quickly. Uh, and I think we could, we could have had a, another hour. I would really like to thank uh, the panel, Alberto, Dominica, Pete and Dennis, and thank you for listening so intently um, and to wish you a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you.